name's Ira Arluk. I'm happy to be here uh, to be able to introduce this panel. Let me just say that uh, picking up on, on two things. One that Frank uh, Joyce mentioned earlier, that uh, there's a, some, among some, he perceives uh, an inferiority complex for the uh, anti-war movement. I, that may have been said in another context. I don't think anyone in this room feels that. I certainly don't. And he's right when he said we were dangerous, and I think it's our obligation to be dangerous in this period. And then taking our cue from uh, Dan Ellsberg, by taking a look at what was in the Burn, what is in the Burns uh, film, what is useful to us, and what we can build on and be dangerous in this current period, and teach the lessons that we learned not only from the war but from our role in it to make it relevant to the perils we face today. So, with that introduction, uh, let me introduce the panel, although they have been adequately introduced uh, in your program. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Bill Zimmerman, star of Stage and Screen, who you've seen, uh, but a long, an old friend and a long time, very hard working anti-war activist. Uh, and then Professor Morris Isserman from Hamilton College. And then uh, from Howie Mockinger, who runs that wonderful uh, full disclosure uh, website for Veterans for Peace. And then Leanne, too, who, uh, Packard, who for so many years provided so many of us with the research that was so essential as in a role at NARMIC, which is, was the National Action uh, Research into the Military Industrial Complex, which was invaluable to, I think, many of us. And then finally, the journalist and, and radio uh, producer and author, Christopher Koch. <laughs> so without any further ado, and without additional introductions, we'll just try to move through it so we have time for conversation. Hello. As many of you know, uh, I played the role of the anti-war activist. <laughs> received very little compensation for it, and a lot of headaches as a result. But uh, I want to make two points uh, about the film. Uh, the first, about the entire 18-hour, 10-episode uh, project. And secondly, about some of the things that were said within the film by those of us who were interviewed. Uh, I'm very ambivalent about the final project, final product. I look at it wearing two hats. The first hat comes as a result of my 10 years in the anti-war movement from 65 to 75, the last five years of which were full time. Uh, <laughs> and also from the perspective of an amateur anti-war historian, having written uh, a memoir published a few years ago called Troublemaker. Wearing that hat, I'm very dissatisfied with what I see in the film. The anti-war movement is treated in simplistic terms without the depth and complexity it deserved, there are so many uh, sins of omission with regard to the anti-war movement. I don't need to catalog uh, all of those omissions for you. You know you're as aware of them as I am. But I also look at the film wearing another hat because after those 10 years as an activist, I've spent the last 40 in political communications. Uh, I had a company in Los Angeles that provided campaign management and communication services to progressive candidates, ballot initiatives, and nonprofit organizations. And those kinds of communications are very different than the kind that a historian tries to get across. Those communications, directed at a mass audience rather than a narrow one, are mostly about headlines, not details. They're mostly about the takeaway from a complex story, rather than each of the facts and figures within that complex story. And wearing that hat, I look at the Ken Burns, Lynn Novick film as a terrific achievement. 
because it has reached more Americans, or it will reach more Americans by the time its shelf life is over, I fear, than all of the efforts that people like you and I have made or will make going forward. We don't have $30 million production budgets. We don't have access to 18 hours of national airtime. And what Burns and Novick have put before the American public has some very positive aspects to it. The history of Ho Chi Minh and French colonialism and our role within it, which many Americans know nothing about. The role of lying presidents, every one of them from Truman to Ford, who were seen with actual tape recordings in the film, uh, proving the fact that they were sending young men and women to die in a war that they knew could not be won. As Dan Ellsberg told us this morning, that's a very important fact for people to know going forward. So my point is this. We have to wear both hats when we look at this film. We have to be mindful when we're critical of the film for everything it left out about the anti-war movement, that wearing that other hat, the film has some utility for us. Uh, and we have to be as mindful, trying to take advantage of the good parts of the film, that there are serious flaws in it that need to be corrected. And hopefully going forward, the writings, the speech making, the filmmaking that all of us can do in the years ahead will help fill in those gaps. And that, in a sense, we need to be somewhat grateful to Burns and Novick for giving us a platform from which we can do further education. Now, my second point is a little more personal, uh, and it has to do with responsibility for some of the things said in the film. Uh, and I want to cite two examples. Uh, I said at some point, I believe it was in episode eight, but I'm not sure, that we were pursuing the wrong strategy as an anti-war movement. And during the interview that I gave, uh, which was three hours long, from which about nine minutes uh, were selected, uh, in the interview, I said we were pursuing the wrong strategy, specifically talking about May Day, and not the anti-war movement. Uh, I argued that May Day was a tactical and strategic failure. Uh, I'm sure some of you here would disagree with that, and I'd be happy to discuss that uh, in another forum. But I went on after talking about the strategic failure uh, of May Day to say that at a time when a majority of the, of the American people were moving toward opposition to the war. The anti-war movement required them to risk arrest or injury to participate, and that that was our mistake, and that we needed to change strategy and allow people to join us and allow that growing majority to have some kind of organizational presence because by turning people away, we were losing an opportunity to effectively oppose the war. And then I explained in the interview, but not in the film, that as a result of that shift in thinking, a number of organizations got underway that did the kind of work that I argued needed to be done at that point. Work that would be inclusive, that would invite people to participate without the risk of injury or arrest. And you all know the list of organizations that came about as a result. Project Air War, the Indochina Peace Campaign, uh, NARMIC, Medical Aid for Indochina, the Indochina Peace Campaign. Those organizations joined with others who had been around for a long time, like AFSC, uh, CALC, uh, and uh, Women's Strike, SANE, and so forth. And in the two years, May Day, leading up to the signing of the Peace Accords, 
Those organizations involved hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people in some sort of statement opposing the war, whether it was attending an educational rally that the Indochina Peace Campaign put together or reading a pamphlet that Narmik prepared or giving 10 bucks to medical aid for Indochina uh, so that medical assistance could be sent to Hanoi, whatever it was, vast networks were created. And it was only because those networks came into existence that when the peace accords were signed in 73, they could be drawn together under the leadership of the coalition to stop funding the war and an extremely effective national lobbying campaign was launched and over the two years between the signing of the peace accords in 73 and the end of the war in 75, appropriations for the government of South Vietnam came up on three occasions and on all three of those occasions our lobbying cut those appropriations by one th uh, half to two-thirds. That resulted in a shortage of fuel and ammunition for the South Vietnamese Army and led to the eventual collapse of that government on April 30th, 1975. I put all that into my interview. And what was taken from the interview and used in the film was, we're pursuing the wrong strategy. And because the film covered nothing of the anti-war movement, for four years, from 1971, May, May Day was May 1971, to the fall of Saigon in April 1975, the only thing we saw in the Burns and Novick film over those four years was a demeaning portrayal of Jane Fonda in North Vietnam. Now, I saw a rough cut of this film two years ago, as did the other people interviewed. And I spent a great deal of time trying to convince Burns and Novick that they were making a mistake in their portrayal of the anti-war movement. I failed, obviously. Uh, so when you look at that segment of the film, understand that when someone does a three-hour interview and signs a release, they lose control of what they said. That what happens subsequently is up to the filmmakers, not the person interviewed. I think that's an easy lesson to get across. But let me describe the same situation in terms of Nancy Bieberman, who has taken a great deal of heat from a lot of people in our community because she's apologized uh, to soldiers who were called baby killers. Now in her experience, she saw that. Whether she imagined it or it actually happened, I can't say. But that's her memory of it. She was interviewed for three hours, six years ago. They intended to use her as a main figure in the film because her father was a World War II combat veteran and they wanted to contrast anti-war activism in one generation with pro-war uh, work in another. Of the three-hour interview, they picked that one statement that she made to use in the film and left out everything else. In the other parts of her interview, she described being proud of the anti-war movement, being proud that she participated in it. She talked about how it had created an enormous influence in her life. She went on to do extraordinary work as a nonprofit uh, lawyer working for uh, poor people's housing in the South Bronx over a 25-year period, and she was quite chagrined uh, about the role that she came to play in the film. Now, that role wasn't her choice. It was Burns and Novick who decided to use just that one statement and who placed it not in the middle of the film where it might have been more appropriately used, but at the very end where it made Nancy look like she was apologizing for the entire anti-war movement, which wasn't the case. So again, my point is a simple one. Direct your anger at the filmmakers, not at the people 
who tried to make the film a little better than it turned out to be. Thank you. I just want to add two words. Shelby Foote. Yeah. You probably didn't know Shelby Foote was in the Vietnam series. In fact, he's not. But you've all seen, this. how many of you have seen the Civil War series? Okay, and if you saw the Civil War series, you remember Shelby Foote. Shelby Foote is on seven times more at length than anybody else. The next uh, talking head contender was Barbara Fields. On the 25th anniversary of the release of the Civil War series, Ken Burns did a series of interviews in which he said, what is this series about? It's about how slavery uh, caused the war. It's about how the greatest outcome of the war was the ending of slavery. And I believe Ken Burns really believes that. Uh, but he's wrong, because what the Civil War is really about is Shelby Foote because Shelby Foote is so damn telegenic. He tells such funny, folksy uh, stories. He seems so much uh, uh, the embodiment of the humble Confederate soldier uh, and, and exemplifies the bravery and the courage of the ordinary soldier. Uh, plus he admires uh, Confederate leaders, uh, some of whom are worthy of admiration, and one of whom uh, who is particularly taken with, Nathan Bedford Forrest, is not. Uh, all of that is the lost cause narrative, as historian David Blake and others have described it, as opposed to the emancipationist narrative. So Barbara Fields represented the emancipationist uh, narrative. She said it was a war about slavery. She said that uh, slaves and uh, free people of color uh, were not just the passive recipients of emancipation, but participated in their self-emancipation, slaves by running away, uh, free men and former slaves by uh, taking part in the Union Army. Uh, and that, I think, is what Ken Burns wanted to convey. But because of the way he tells stories, he wound up telling a very different story. Notice it. Okay, so the relevance to uh, the Vietnam series. When somebody appears uh, in a Ken Burns series, they are kept in a kind of vacuum locked bag. Nobody can interrogate anything they said. Nobody can challenge anything they said. If Shelby Foote says the Civil War was caused by the Northern aggression coming down into places like Tennessee, uh, it's not like Barbara Fields can say, but Shelby, what about this? What about that? And similarly, when Carl Marlantes was an enormously appealing figure, you may remember, he, he opens the uh, series. He says coming back uh, to the United States was as hard as fighting the war. He was a, a hero. He was a Marine Corps officer, former Rhodes Scholar, uh, won the Navy Cross uh, for gallantry, uh, later wrote a best-selling novel about his experience. Very appealing uh, character. Uh, no one can cross-examine him. And so when he says he lands at Travis Air Force Base and his brother gets him and hurries him into a car and anti-war activists are pounding on the back of the car and calling him a baby killer, nobody gets to question that, even though the footage that accompanies that claim shows a group of uh, anti-war activists at some unnamed airport, one of them clearly wearing the shirt saying, active duty GI against the war. They're handing out leaflets. Nobody's shouting. Nobody's pounding on any car. Um, in, a, in a Ken Burns film, whether it's the Civil War or Vietnam, uh, the testimony of uh, witnesses, as they're called in the Vietnam series, is unimpeachable. You can't go back and um, challenge it. Uh, so that's, I think, the innocent explanation for what happened and what went wrong with the Burns series. But there's another explanation as well, and this comes back to Nancy Bieberman. Uh, lots of the people who uh, testify in the film uh, have backstories. So uh, Tim O'Brien has a backstory, Bill Earhart, anti-war people, but uh, people who are coming out of, uh, were veterans themselves, or Carol Crocker, whose brother was killed in Vietnam. They're very sympathetic, we know about where they went to school, where they grew up, uh, something about them before they uh, come and talk to us as participants, as witnesses of 
this event. Not so the two out of 80 witnesses who uh, spoke as non-veteran uh, anti-war protesters. One is uh, Bill, who is at least identified as uh, having been a student at the University of Chicago. He has that much of a bad story, although nothing beyond that. Uh, but here's Nancy Bieberman, who is not identified uh, in any way. Uh, she went to Barnard. We don't learn that from the uh, series. I only know that because I know a friend, a mutual friend, uh, who appears a grand total of twice, once I think in the ninth episode, where she speaks uh, briefly and not very memorably as anti-war witness. And then in the very final episode where uh, she talks about uh, calling people baby killers and uh, her very last words, the very last words we hear from anybody against the war is, I'm sorry. Now, I don't know if she called anyone a baby killer. I don't know if anybody called Carl Marlantes a baby killer. But the result of those editorial decisions, which are entirely a matter of Burns and Novak's decisions, is that we are left with the image of the baby killer taunting anti-war protester as representative of the anti-war movement. Nobody says, you know, this was a one-off, this may have happened, it happened, you know, there were three million vets and six million protesters, of course there were going to be some uncomfortable confrontations. No one ever says that. What we are left with in the very last episode, in the very last words of the last anti-war witness, is an apology. And that, I think, is unforgivable. Yes. Yes. Amen. There, you should have links to our website on your seats, and we have lots of literature upstairs. Now, what I'm going to say, I don't really expect agreement here, but I want to provoke a discussion. Burns and Novick, while they could not ignore the anti-war movement, exhibit little interest in its dynamics, except in its supposed hostility to American GIs. Since my interest still lies in how to build a more effective anti-war movement, I want to focus on the lessons learned and not learned by the Vietnam anti-war movement as a prelude to exploring the state of the current anti-war movement as it confronts multiple wars and threats of war right now. Of course, there was not one unified anti-war movement, but a conglomeration of tendencies featuring contending critiques, strategies, and tactics. What follows is an attempt at a succinct, dispassionate description of these tendencies, which no doubt risks oversimplification. I'll start by looking at three tendencies, beginning with a critique of tendencies with which I was associated. The first set of tendencies included the anti-imperialists, militants, and Marxist-Leninists. Members of these overlapping but distinct groupings all grasped that the depth of the problem that the war in Vietnam, they grasped the depth of the problem the war in Vietnam exposed. The war was not a mistake or an aberration from the general direction of U.S. global policy. Its goal was to become as powerful as it could in the world, and in this particular case, to gain a strategic foothold in mainland Asia. These movement tendencies recognized the need to do more and to widen the scope of protests. They also placed great importance in connecting to and humanizing the Vietnamese enemy, not merely viewing them as victims, but recognizing and honoring their capacity to resist. Too often, however, the connection remained abstract or turned romantic. Che's invocation of too too many Vietnams not only decontextualized Vietnamese resistance, but led people to ignore or downplay the incredible price paid for this resistance. In the 1980s, an uncritical anti-imperialism led to support for leaders who proved to be problematic, such as Carpio in El Salvador, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, and Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. One version of anti-imperialism meant support for any leader hostile to the U.S., including people like Saddam Hussein or Bashar al-Assad. For them, the enemy of our enemy, by definition, became a friend. Anti-imperialists did not always recognize other negative forces operating in the world, aside from U.S. imperialism. 
The romanticization of the Vietnamese resistance also led militants to overstate the revolutionary possibilities in 1960s and 70s America. Some resorted to violent methods that proved ineffective, isolating, and divisive for the movement as a whole. Though violence as a strategy, not as spontaneous outbursts, constituted a small part of the anti-war movement, it too often became the issue and functioned to divert attention from the monumentally greater violence of imperial war. The parts of this tendency that identified with global communism, a relatively small but still influential sector, had little understanding of that movement, weak grasp of the Sino-Soviet split, and were often ignorant of differences within Vietnamese communism. Sometimes the result was a dumbed-down and sanitized Ma Maoism. Their version of democratic centralism was rarely democratic, and they were often drawn into obscure sectarian struggles. That's one tendency. The pacifist left tendency brought a solid grasp of the profound penetration of militarism in the US economy, its politics, and culture. It offered a valuable overall critique of war and militarism. A.J. Muskie and Dave Dellinger played unifying roles in an often fractious movement, and militant pacifists like Dellinger forged a creative model of militant nonviolence that effectively expressed the depth of opposition to the war. But other pacifists enjoyed the role of the good protester as opposed to other less acceptable protesters, thereby dividing the movement and in enabling an establishment critique providing fodder for false equivalences between imperial violence and resistance to it. Pacifists could and did adopt a purer than thou attitude. It should have been possible to legitimize one's own form of protest without delegitimizing other forms. Most significantly, the passive tendency was overwhelmingly white and middle class, with insufficient connection to the powerful movements of people of color that had staked out clear and resonant positions against the war. This was not simply a question of coalition building, but of creating consistent, enduring relations of trust. A third tendency, consisting largely of dissident and liberal Democrats, saw the war as a losing proposition, damaging US credibility, draining treasure, destroying morale and national unity, not to mention increasing battlefield casualties. This is in part the perspective of the Burns Nobler effort. This tendency brought to the light the war's corrosive effect on democratic institutions, the expanding imperial presidency, the impotence and irrelevance of Congress, and the repression of protests. Innovative forms of working the system were created that, while often frustrating, pointed the way to a possible political revitalization. These movements led to some congressional scrutiny, LBJ's abdication, McGovern's nomination as a Democratic candidate in 1972, and Nixon's impeachment, and generally forced politicians to openly deal with the war. But it proved unable to prevent Nixon's election, allowing him to pose as a strange sort of stealth peace candidate, and didn't achieve majority support in the Congress until very late in the war. It did not develop an adequate means of holding politicians accountable. It both expanded the scope of mainstream politics and was simultaneously hemmed in by the establishment. Parts of this tendency also posed as a preferred, less radical alternative to the politics of the street. Finally, its overall pragmatic strategy implied that the wall was a correctable mistake, not requiring a fundamental overhaul of the national security state and its imperial goals. There are important parts of the movement that I have so far ignored. The anti-movement was a boost to the development of a new and creative and feisty women's and queer liberation movements, both by providing spaces for activism and then circumscribing these spaces because of the limits of its leaders' own consciousness of gender issues. So women and LGBTQ people were energized and then marginalized which simultaneously divided the movement and resulted in new organizational forms, including significant anti-war form formations and action, as well as a critique of military and movement macho. The level and sophistication of GI and veteran resistance was unprecedented, as is already pointed out. 
Uh, I just add that it helps transform, Dewey Canning III in particular, help transform the public face of the anti-war movement from that of cowardly, spaced out hippies and unrealistic pacifists. Often buried in the dustbin of history are efforts that have already been talked about in terms of the coffee house movement and, and so on. It certainly would be worthwhile to further explore what was learned about civilian-soldier relationships from this experience. Although after the war, the anti-war movement lost steam and direction, in a sense succumbing to the fantasy that the end of the war allowed a return to normalcy without further consequence. We did not succeed in helping Americans come to terms with military defeat, to understand it as something positive for the American spirit. Vietnam was more isolated in the 1980s than during the American War, as it invaded Cambodia to overthrow the genocidal Khmer Rouge regime and then fought off a Chinese invasion. The Cold War framing of Southeast Asian conflict as part of a Soviet plot was reasserted by the U.S. with little opposition from the remnants of the anti-war movement. The Maoist fringe, in line with Chinese policy, even supported the Khmer Rouge. There were brief upsurges of activity in response to Reagan's Central America wars and before both wars, especially the 2003 war. Today there is this severely perceptible anti-war movement. Its impotence allowed Donald Trump to pay a bogus anti-war card during the 2016 campaign. As anti-war activists, we have allowed the myth of which Burns and Ovi partake of a deep antagonism between the civilian anti-war movements and soldiers to penetrate American consciousness. Lots of younger activists, I thought, would totally believe in the spitting. Um, we can credit Jerry Lemke for Burns and Novick not further propounding that particular myth. They favor baby killers. In any large, sprawling social movement, almost any perspective can be found. Though I did know a few people who felt like targeting soldiers was legitimate, this was quite a marginal perspective in the anti-war movement. The same mythology led many of those opposed to the Gulf Wars to so reassure the public that the movement was pro-soldier, that they lost sight of the central task of any effective anti-war movement, projecting and humanizing the direct victims of the war in Iraq. It was a form of surrender to the prevailing Islamophobia. As a movement, we failed to adequately challenge the deleterious effects of imperial war and democratic institutions. Forever war, means permanent limitations on freedom and the right to protest and continuing intrusions on privacy. We haven't been able to convincingly demonstrate to Americans the connection between successive wars, how the Iraq war increased sectarianism and chaos in the entire region, catalyzing the growth of groups like ISIS, and how, and how we are imprisoned by the terrible logic of war in which the next war is seen as justifiable and necessary response to the failure of the previous war. Given this history, how might a more effective anti-war movement be constituted? First of all, we must acknowledge, embrace even, that maybe none of us in this room will be in the leadership of this reconstitution. If we are together, we can offer perspective, some cautions, a necessary connection to past efforts. Multiracial forces already in motion will lead the new activist, peace, anti-war movement. For instance, the movement for black life highlights the militarization and racism of our criminal justice system while connecting to global struggles of people of color. The immigration and refugee movements with important experience in navigating cultural difference have drawn attention to the connection between war, state, violence, and population movement and alerted us to the role of racism and Islamophobia in mobilizing and justifying aggressive wars. Environmental activists will lead us to revalue the leadership of indigenous people as in standing rock. Organizations like 350.org explicate the relationship between environmental degradation and wars and potential wars over natural resources, as well as leading to increased global migration. The new women's and, L women's and LGBTQ movements have led the way in expanding our consciousness of sexual violence in war and in the military. A new anti-war movement must be constituted and led by these forces 
which will both broaden and deepen the movement, making evident the intersectionality of movements against oppression, white supremacy, militarism, and war. We are living in a dangerous moment for our and other species. The impact of climate change imposes a fatal due date. The prevalence of nuclear weapons along with authoritarian leaders eager to demonstrate their macho add to the immediate peril. So a broad-based anti-war movement which challenges white and male supremacy and stands in support of people around the globe, from the Rohingya to the Palestinians, is an important part of a larger movement for social change. One that can navigate racial, class, gender, generational, ideological, spiritual, strategic, and tactical, tactical differences is required. Absolute agreement is not required. Rather, a Zen-like mastery of the art of coordination, mutuality, and solidarity is the order of the day. We don't need one big organization, but we do need accountable organizations with accountable leadership. Our movement must not be so correct that it does not allow for experimentation and a diversity of tactics. The movement must strive for powers that creates an open and welcoming environment where rather than being stigmatized or shamed for inevitable mistakes, Activists can learn from them and grow with the movement. And we must make our case to ordinary people while still engaging in anti-racist and anti-sexist initiatives. The other side is driven by a mean-spirited white male nationalism that we must directly take on. And I'll leave that by last few paragraphs. Right away, the right way, and never did in a clear way, is that there was no justification under international law at any point in time for the U.S. to intervene in Vietnam. Now, you all know that in this room, but this is a very important message that, that any documentary on the Vietnam War must say from the get-go. The other thing and we're talking about lessons, is the course of primary lesson is that bad things happen when you violate or fail to honor international peace agreements. And I think this is a timely point to make right now. And the Burns and Novick uh, documentary failed to explore adequately uh, the option of taking the route of negotiated peace. They did not um, make clear that there were diverse significant groupings in Vietnam who were prevented time and time again. We're talking about since the 1950s through 1975 from play playing an important constructive role in bringing Vietnam towards reconciliation. And if that had happened, you know, just think of the controversial. It's actually bad for any particular side to, to dominate. You know, the, the, the way that the war ended with a military victory uh, for, for the revolutionary side was actually not good for the Vietnamese people, not even good for the revolutionary side, um, much less, you know, for, for, the, for the other parties, because I, Countries develop uh, a better democracy, a better uh, political environment, a better economic environment from having policies that different parts of the population can have a role in and can play a role in. And that was prevented because time and time again, I would blame more US policymakers, even though so, you know, there, there were times when other parties also uh, played a role in preventing a, a, a peaceful solution, but it was largely U.S. policymakers. They rejected numerous opportunities for a peaceful settlement. And I'll put back to back in this, the 1954 Geneva Accords and the 1972 Paris Peace Agreement. Between these 18 years, we know that millions of Vietnamese, Lao, Cambodians, and Americans were killed. 
the destruction of the Vietnamese countryside. I mean, you know, we've, we've all gone through this, so I don't want to repeat it, but just keep in mind, this all happened back to back between these two agreements. And what was the 1972 Paris Peace Agreement? But it is, at its core, the 1954 Geneva Agreement. So, and, and don't believe me in this. I would invite each of you, when you have time, to look at both agreements and see, you know, how much different it is. It's not all that different. And yet, what was the cost in that interval? That is the lesson that Burns and Novick should have made very clear to the American people and to the rest of the world. And the, the other thing that they ignored, uh, which is a key insight of the Pentagon Papers, which they only mentioned in passing, is that South Vietnam is essentially a creation of the United States. And so much of the implied narrative, you know, in the Burns and Novick of a separate country in the South, and all of that was not based on any firm foundation. Uh, that should also be made clear. They tried to legitimize, I mean, I would say that there's a lot of good things about the Burns and Novick um, film, so I don't want you to interpret what I'm saying as a complete trash of it. It is not. But I don't want to go through the good stuff, because I think that you see, you'll see what are the merits of the piece. So I'm mainly focusing on the flaws in the, piece, in the piece. What they would like you to think is that their, their documentary is very good because they avail themselves of the most recent scholarship. But since they're not Vietnam experts, you know, they were actually based in the woods as when it came to this, and I think they admitted that in interviews, that they came knowing nothing and they learned a lot, which is true, they learned a lot, but they didn't learn enough. And what I mean by they didn't learn enough is that they, they the irony is that while they correctly criticized American policymakers for their ignorance, and in their ignorance, making very um, terrible mistakes, you know, at great cost to everybody, great human cost. Luckily, their flaws are not as consequential as the flaw, as, as, as the ignorance of US policy makers, but they also ended up being played by different forces with different agendas. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you, you may be surprised to see a lot of stuff about the, the, the North Vietnamese side, you know, what was happening in Hanoi and so on. And if you also remember that we, we, there was one key um, person who was being demonized, mm -hmm. and that was Les Van. You know, Les Van was the root of all evil for the North. And I actually have no um, great love for Les Van one way or another, but it was a big mistake to blame everything on him. But, but, so I asked various friends of mine who are historians um, and experts in Vietnam, you know, who, who gains from demonizing Liz Wang? Well, as it turns out, people like Henry Kissinger hate people, people like Liz Wang. The Chinese hate Liz Wang. Even um, part of the, you know, current ruling Politburo in Vietnam don't care much for him either. So it's very convenient to escape, you know, to turn the scapegoat on this man. And, and it's done by recent scholars of Vietnam because time doesn't stand still. I mean, there's always a fight for narrative. And at this point, people like Henry Kissinger, the Chinese, you know, various people in Vietnam had a narrative that they want to lead. And, but the, the Burns and Novick people aren't aware of everything that is under the current. And nor no should they have to be. But if you're not aware of things that are under the cur under current, you should act as if you do and, and, and tell narratives that are quite false. Because it just misleads, it confuses, it doesn't serve any purpose. 
while doing all of that, this, it's, it's time that's wasted on things that you should have talked about. And one of the things towards the end of the war that was very strange that they really didn't mention in passing, you know, but, um, but has been mentioned here, is, is, is the genocide in Cambodia. That was really not talked about. There are many large omissions like that. But I'm, just, I'm going to stop here um, and leave it for, for, for the discussion. But the main point that I want to make is that the lesson is let's not ignore and violate international peace agreements because we can see from 1954 to 1972 what happens when we do. And, oh, and I'll leave it one other last thing because listening to it, the talk about uh, Ambassador Graham Martin at the very end in 75 when he kept resisting, 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 and he was hoping for negotiated settlement at that point. And I thought, why did he hope for that in, you know, after the agreement was signed when Teal was trying to crush the third segment and, 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 and jail political prisoners, you know, and, 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 and bomb everybody, you know, why did he wish for that then, but he only wished for it when, when the revolutionary forces were at the gate? It's a bit late. But that seems to be part of this tragedy. A word of advice. Do not be the last speaker on a panel with this articulate people all who agree with each other. <laughs> I don't know what I can add, but... Um, I do want to say a couple of kind of broad things. There's much to like, or even to love in this film, I think. First of all, it's beautifully shot. The collection of stock footage is amazing. I think combat is probably shown as realistically as it's ever been. Maybe not entirely as realistic as it is, but there's a lot there. Uh, the officer class is, is badly damaged in the film. Um, the, the, our men, our young men were led by Idiots. I mean, hello. And the upper, the upper echelons of the military come off no better in the film. All that's terrific. Um, I think the G. I'm sorry. I think the um, the GIs are are given a kind of compassionate treatment that they haven't been given before. And I think that's very important. We see them as real human beings struggling with problems. We see where they come from. We see the homes they come from, etc. Unfortunately, the same treatment is not given to anybody else in the film than the GIs. Um, there were 2,700,000 2, young men and women, a few women, uh, more now, of course, went over and fought in Vietnam. Six million of us opposed the war. That's a lot of people. Um, none of us are really profiled in depth. They don't go to our homes. They don't see where the college we went to. Uh, we have limited examples that were mentioned earlier. So we come across not quite in the same sense. The same with Vietnamese. It's wonderful in the film to actually hear from Viet Cong and from North Vietnamese soldiers and to hear from Vietnamese. That's terrific. But there's no backstory to them. You don't get to know them the same way we know our own soldiers. You know. Um, the biggest problem, I think, emerges right at the top of the film. He says, basically, the narration, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like, um, uh, decent men on both sides made honest mistakes. And in order to convince us of that, everything has those false balances throughout the entire film. Um, yes, uh, we did do some terrible things in villages, but they tortured our men when they captured them. Uh, yes, we lost 58,000 men, but, you know, uh, I mean, we killed a lot of them, but they killed a lot of us. Uh, these are false balances. 50, terrible though it is that we lost 58,000 of our young men. They lost, according to Burns and Novak, I think, 2 million. Most historians, I think, say 3 million. The Vietnamese say 6 million. Put it on a scale, 58,000 does not balance out 6 million people. It just doesn't. This reaches kind of an absurd moment, I think, in the film when um, the narrative, when, when Peter Gaudi, who's a wonderful narrator, I think, although a little grim, um, says, we call them goats, kings, and monosons. They call us invaders and imperialists. <laughs> well, that's not even other guys. You know, you call something a book and again, you're diminishing them, you're making them inhuman. We were, in fact, invaders. We came in here using an accurate term for us. Um, it's interesting, you know, communism, in a sense, had an advantage over us when it came to propaganda. When I was in North Vietnam in 1965, um, people would come up to me in the street and say, oh, you must be Czechoslovakia, no, I'm American. Oh, you know, it can't be, yeah, I'm an American. And then they would say, it must be so difficult for you living in your country. 
They did not hate Americans, they hated our government. There was no animus against us as individual human beings. They liked, they admired us. You know, Ho Chi Minh wanted to kind of base his, his um, socialist, communist democracy on American principles, all right? The problem with all this is that nobody is held accountable in the film. We are, nobody's held accountable. And that's, I think, why we can so easily go into Iraq, why we can go to Afghanistan, and why we're going to have endless wars in the future. Because nobody did anything wrong. They were just honest people making mistakes. There's one scene where he talks about an American general hovering a helicopter above my life watching the slaughter. Hello, I think this is a war crime, guys. I really do. I think they need to be tried. So until they're held accountable, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. What do we, well, we used to raise our children saying, be responsible for what you do. It may be a mistake, but you still have to take responsibility for it. That's how you're being a growing up and an adult. That's the thing this country hasn't yet done. So, so we have, I think, half an hour, correct me if I'm wrong, for questions, comments, and uh, interaction with the panel, and they with each other. So if you raise your hands, one here, one there. OK, I'll try to get to everybody. Yes, go ahead. I think they were great presentations, and in terms of uh, the firm's documentary, um, there's one point I wanted to make about that, which I think many of us probably already know. But the idea that this was not a civil war, I think the best ammunition now we have for that is the words of our president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, in his uh, memoirs, Mandate for Change, where he says clearly that if the election would have gone through in 1956, Ho Chi Minh would have won 80% of the vote. There is no two sides. Ask Ike. So that's number one. Um, but the second thing is what I would like to do for whatever time is, you know, right now I think that we're, you know, uh, with Trump and the deep state and the militarists and the rest of them, you know, there's Afghanistan, there's North Korea, uh, there's Iran, and I think there's Russia that uh, public opinion is being set up for in terms of military confrontation with. So I would like to maybe uh, try to focus a little bit on how some of these lessons can be applied to what is very clear to me, uh, the urgent need to begin the basis, uh, the, the ground floor of a new anti-war movement in this country. My name is James Williamson. Um, I, I, heard, I went to a preview screening of the portions, excerpts of the film at Harvard in late spring. Uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick were there, and a couple of key uh, consultant advisors to the film were there. Uh, one of them was a gentleman by the name of Tom Vallelli, uh, and the other was Tony, a gentleman by the name of Tony Sage. In the excerpt that I saw, I heard the narrator say, retaliation for Gulf of Tonkin. Then during the discussion after with Ken Burns and, and others, I heard Ken Burns say, in a, in a different context, retaliation for Gulf of Tonkin. I was shocked. As you know, um, well, it's interesting because two weeks later in I.F. Stone's weekly, uh, I.F. Stone based in part on Wayne Morse's uh, statements on the floor of the Senate because he'd been in the hearing uh, where he got some of the information. Uh, I have still pointed out essentially what had happened. There was no second so-called incident, and that there was actually, uh, more came out later, it was a, there was a CIA operation called Op Plan 34A, which involved raids on the coast of North Vietnam for months preceding the PT boat attack on the, the first of the two days in August. Now, so where was the retaliation? Unfortunately, I still actually uses that word in, in his publication at one point, but that's another story. Anyway, based on that, I wrote a piece that's available at Counterpunch. Before I saw the episode where he actually goes into a more detailed presentation of his version of Gulf of Tonkin. Now, when I finally saw it, he actually includes some of this information, but it's on the one hand, on the other. It fudges. It, there's an animation where there are uh, he, he, the narrator says South Vietnamese Navy were attacking the coast of North.
North. There was no South Vietnamese Navy. This was a CIA operation. So there are important flaws that they, there's no question they knew what the truth was. So that's just a comment and, you know, sort of, if you care to comment, but also because I had a conversation earlier with Bill Zimmerman, who said he thought the role of Tom Valelli was quite significant in this film, and I would invite a Bill and anyone else to talk about the role of some of these sort of Kennedy School uh, Vietnam veteran consultants in shaping the framing of the film. I'm Walter T. Uh, I want to first to I really appreciate the many different contributions of critics about the film and its content and its meaning. I agree with a lot of it. I disagree with a couple of things. But mostly I'm concerned that what's going to be the impact of this film. Most of the people, I think, who are going to watch it in the coming years don't know half of what we know. Don't know a quarter. And so the question that remains, question remains, is, is the effect of the film going to be to help prevent wars like what happened in Vietnam and other countries? Or is the effect going to be to whitewash not only the crimes that were committed, but the consequences that should flow of those crimes? So at least I'm going to pass out about my thoughts about that. But I want to remind us of one other thing. This gathering in part came together because a lot of us know about and are concerned that the Pentagon that we demonstrated against in 1967 it's not just a war machine, but it's also a propaganda machine. And one of the ways it wins the war of propaganda is to control the content of films and movies. Lots of recent books and freedom of information stuff has come out to show that this is true. So my question is, is the film simply a documentary, or is it a propaganda film? And I would argue that if you start it by a lie, a lie being they, and this just happened because of good intentions. Well, they were not with good intentions. The, the U.S. has been trying to invade or interfere with Vietnam going back to 1845. Anyone wants to know about that? I'll be happy to talk about it. But right now, there's a 13-year campaign being mounted with millions of dollars, I don't know how many, by the Pentagon to rewrite the history of Vietnam and perhaps this film is part of that process. So therefore, I think we should be aware of the propaganda, and we should be aware this is a long struggle. My name is Alan Haber. I spoke a little earlier about the levitation. I didn't get a chance to read the entire uh, yeah, script of the levitation. But the problem that I see is that not only the film, but also the anti-war movement begins itself either with an illusion or a lie. That in 1970, in 1962, John Kennedy had begun to see, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that the Cold War was a mistake, it had to be ended, not won. He began to make rapprochement with Khrushchev, he began to make rapprochement with Castro, began to uh, criticize Israel for refusing to uh, allow investigate inspection of their nuclear facilities. And for that reason, he was murdered. He was murdered by inside the government. And that, that cover up, the false story of, of Lee Harvey Oswald, is the lie that has created a cognitive dissonance in the American people. So this film begins nothing about Kennedy having a view of ending the war. It's, he, was, he just kind of overloaded as part of the war machine. There was a war party that took power by a coup d'etat in 1963, and that party has been in power since. It has made alliance with the neoconservatives from the Israeli side of things, because in the Middle East, there has to be, as the Israelis saw, a, a uh, destabilization of all the regimes there, and that was laid out immediately after 9-1-1, which was the new Pearl Harbor that the project for the American century said was necessary to make the mobilization for the invasion of Afghanistan, Iraq, ultimately Iran. So we are controlled by a war party, some of which is, for, is 
visible, some of which is not. But until the peace movement begins to look for what are the actual politics and the political actors operating here, we are also part of the illusion and the bubble of er erroneous ideas. No, it is an intent to dominate the world by the Americans, with now in the Middle East, the protection of the Israeli state. That's what we have to deal with now. Hello, 
xin chào 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 xin was asked to contact John by Jane Fonda when I made my first trip to Vietnam in January of 1987. So, and then I, it changed my life, that first trip, because it was the fifth poorest nation on earth and children were dying from lack of antibiotics. I was an actress, not a filmmaker. I sold everything I had, my husband and I, and we started going back and he said, you're going to make a film. So let me talk to you about filmmaking and empower you, your families, your daughters, your sons, your neighbors. They can make films now because we, the iPhone. Oh, my name, Tanya Tiana Alexandra Silverfon. Uh, Tiana World would be easier uh, and VietnamTrilogy.com or VietnamTrilogy.org you can find out uh, about the, the three films that I'm making based on thousands of hours of footage of going throughout Vietnam since January of 1987. So we have the general and me today. John was kind enough to squeeze in a uh, trailer of three minutes. Some of you didn't see it and we'll be very, very happy to get it out to you through John McAuliffe. Um, Walter T. said something uh, about, perhaps you're thinking, ooh, another conspiracy theory. Believe it, I'm a filmmaker. My late husband was an Oscar winner. My partner uh, doing plays and operas, we just presented something at Kennedy Center. Believe it, he's an Oscar winner and a uh, multiple Tony winner. And we all believe it because we know it, because we know the industry backwards and forwards. I would like to respectfully address you. I am so moved by your passion. This is hard work, what you've been doing. Unpaid and, and most times misunderstood. And it's been really, really hard. You have your family, the next generation, John, your son. I thank you, but I offer this to you. Make your own films. Write your own stories. You, Please, don't. this is, you are dreaming to think, oh, well, Ken Burns shoulda, coulda, woulda, or the documentary film must do this, but no. When you make your films, nobody's gonna tell you how to do it. You're gonna make it your way. When you write your book, we have so many wonderful authors. Why would you let anyone tell you? Now, about Ken Burns. I have a history I won't go into, but he went out and raised the money based on his name. Also, also what Walter Teague is talking about, yes, all of us, all of you know people who've been trying to make films about Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, about the Holocaust in Southeast Asia, and you know how hard it is to raise any kind of corporate money? How did Ken Burns get the Bank of America? to put out this kind of money, and then of course David Koch, at first it was the Koch brothers, and then they changed it to David Koch. Uh, but he funds, unless some of you don't know, NPR and PBS anyway. So we are all being had if we are this naive, and those of you who have been in this for so long and dedicated your lives to this. Right? Make your films, write your stories, and you saw me with my iPhone, 4K. This is not the latest, this is the third one back. And it looks really good on the web. And so here you are, the next generation. So about what you can do and empower yourselves, write it down and shoot it and get someone to edit it. You can learn very easily iMovie or get someone young from high school, one of your neighbor's friends, to help you. And I thank you so much. You have saved your dedication, your passion, your being just good human beings, good citizens of this great country. Because of you, you make it great. Thank you, because my family was saved by so many Bao Ninh, whom you saw in the Ken Burns, uh, Ken Burns, the Vietnam War, Bao Ninh, the shock of white hair, the Vietnamese who were so articulate, you were riveted by him. It was not said over 18 hours, only in the last, with the little card. It, we didn't know that he wrote The Sorrow War unless you knew. We weren't told that he was 
a, a great author of a novel that you must see. So yes, it is very, very, not only manipulated, but it's really slick propaganda. So make your own propaganda. And here's a great filmmaker right here. Don North, The 10,000 Day War. Burns's uh, what was making him tick. If you listened, are you here? No. If you if you looked in between the two showings, it would go from eight to nine forty-five, and then it would go from here in Washington from ten until a quarter to eleven, uh, quarter to eleven, and in Burns talks for a few minutes, and he says. The 10 years that I was preparing this film and looking over material, I didn't have an axe to grind. He actually says that. And I was thinking, why not? <laughs> and so if you're looking for motivation here and what this man was going to do, that should tell you exactly what you need to know. And nothing else will be surprising. <laughs> my name is Chris Bird, and I'm a filmmaker and an activist, and I'm here representing Mayday Video along with Roger Hickey, Joni Shawara, and uh, Eddie Becker. We made a movie in 1971 about Mayday, uh, and uh, it's from your point of view, it's from our point of view, it's from behind the lines of demonstrators, and if you're frustrated by the lack of representation in the Ken Burns movie, if you think he's a soporific, boring filmmaker, or if you're so, uh, suspicious of a movie editorially, just from the very beginning, seeing who the funders are, our movie was made without funding, and I have a flyer, it's on vimeo.com on demand, and it's called Mayday 1971 Raw. If you want to feel the fervor of 1970s utopian activism, check out this movie. Please tell your friends about it. If there's any university people, please let me know. I have flyers if you don't want to write down vimeo.com. I hope you have an axe to grow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Howard Farmer. And I think I have kind of a unique perspective because in the mid-60s, I was operating a satellite Earth station in Hawaii to connect Vietnam with Washington, D.C. It was said at the time they were using airmail uh, to do that. But I used to have to monitor the conversations to check on the quality. And so, one time for Gulf of Tonkin number two, I'd like to reiterate, it was the CIA that was talking about this incident and they called up the Pentagon and they said, should we tell LBJ about this and what should we tell him? And it was that point I realized the influence, the great influence of the CIA. So that was under discussion. The second thing is, it's been pointed out that our generals and upper echelons were not very confident. There was a time when a code red came out. That means everyone gets off the line. And the general calls up to his secretary and says, can you send my golf clubs over here to Saigon right away? <laughs> and the third thing, by the way, I lost my security clearance because I wrote a letter to the global newspaper expressing my opposition to the war, which wasn't very smart. I was working with the military. But um, what gave me great hope was, do you remember Maxwell Taylor? He was the ambassador yeah, being the general. And one day he called up his mother, and I was listening to this, and his mother says, Maxwell, have you been eating well? <laughs> yes, Mom, yes, Mom. Then she says, from what I've been reading, you're not doing a very good job. <laughs> and there was a pregnant pause. <laughs> and he said, look, I'll be home for Thanksgiving with you. We'll talk about it. The next day in the paper, he's coming home for meetings with LBJ. <laughs> That's, that's the way I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm John Calanato. Uh, I want to also thank the panelists for what they added to the uh, analysis of the film, which is helpful. I only want to take up one point, uh, not because I argue with everything that the brother said up here, but just on one point in my 
in my seat, Mike Pesk today, representing the world of communism. And I would say that our tenant is not, our tenant is not the enemy, of, our enemy is our friend. It's more, the main enemy is at home. And we are, and we, are, we know that U.S. imperialism is what brings the, this, uh, these wars to the world. And my experience with the Gulf of Tonkin was the day after the Gulf of Tonkin was announced and the bombing started, we were out at the UN with 30 people marching around saying that this was a lie. Did we know what happened in Tonkin? No. But we knew that the U.S. imperialism was lying to end this war. And if we happened to make a mistake, we'd be able to look it down. So I just want to thank you for that and say, oh, just one more thing. Everyone's talking about young people. I'm going to speak to 15 young people tomorrow about the Vietnam War, about my books, of course. And there are people who have been out in the streets fighting against white supremacy. There are people around 20 years old on the heritage. So there are people out in the streets right now who are fighting. They're not 6 million at the, at, uh, at the peak of the Vietnam War, thing, but there are people out there who are struggling, and they will become part of the anti war movement, too. Thank you. So in terms of how the movie's going to be used, Burns and Elbert have a strategy to put it in the schools. And I've, I've worked in the schools, and one of my friends who's a social studies educator says there's three things that social studies teachers complain about that they can't teach well. Reconstruction, Western expansion, and the Vietnam War. So I think the fear here is that a social studies teacher who doesn't feel like they know anything will show one, uh, so I think we need, we actually have an alternative curriculum on the Vietnam Full Disclosure website, but we need to do more than that and connect to a lot of teachers who are now much more open to alternative views. <coughs> I just want to say one other thing, that the whole thing of this was multiple truths, remember that? There's always, but when it came to anti-war demonstrations, you know, you, 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 you would have a representative of every battle that was fought, but there's no one representing who was at Chicago, just Phil Caputo was covering it, and there's no one representing who was at May Day. Um, and so when they talk about the demonstration, somehow the multiple truths view viewpoint is absent. Well, I was asked specifically about uh, Tom Vallely, so let me answer that question first. Uh, if you notice in the closing credits of the film, there are 12 or 13 people who are credited as advisors. Of those advisors, there's only one uh, representing our point of view, and that was Todd Gitlin. And I'm afraid uh, that Todd didn't play much of a role uh, in advising Ken and Lynn as they did the film. Uh, Valerie clearly uh, is separated from the other advisors in the credits and listed as the senior consultant. So he did have a very significant role. Uh, clearly the history uh, is portrayed the way U.S. imperialism wanted it portrayed as a civil war. Uh, rather than an act of anti-communist hysteria on the part uh, of the United States. But I also want to say that it only gets us so much to sit around and complain about this film and criticize what we all already know. The film had a $30 million budget. That budget doesn't come from our community. It comes from people who have an interest in maintaining the status quo. That shouldn't surprise us. You know, we're not teenagers here. We know that's how the system works. We live in a real world, and if we want to have an impact on that real world, we need to put our ideological blinders aside every once in a while and think in practical, strategic terms about what we can do to advance our ideas. Now, the people here who have suggested making films, I think, are doing exactly the right thing. We need to use this film to get our own message out. 
We can sit around and carp about its failures and its flaws. They should be obvious to most of us, if not all of us. They don't require uh, a seminar like this to review. Uh, people like Chris on my left have written, uh, a terrific, have written terrific pieces. Maurice wrote a terrific piece uh, about the nature of the film. Now let's move on and let's make plans for how to take advantage of it. If this is going to influence uh, the, the students of the future, whether they be high school students or college students in history courses, let's create alternative materials. So those teachers and professors who want to give a different point of view are able to do so because they have the audiovisual support that Ken Burns' point of view now has as a result of this film. So, sure, it's good to point out the flaws, it's good to come together around what the truth was, but we also have to function strategically and think about what we want to achieve going forward, what resources we have with which to work, and what we can do to maximize the impact of those resources to tell the truth about what really happened in Vietnam and in the United States among those of us who opposed what was going on in Vietnam. There are some things in it that if we magnify are extraordinarily powerful. What more powerful interview have you ever seen than the one with James Musgrave over that period of time? Yeah. Culminating in his becoming an anti-war protester as a Marine through and through. Or Morley Safer's little bit. Right? Which caused Johnson to call up Frank Stanton and say, are you trying to fuck me? Right? Or when, uh, or the, Neil Sheehan being set up to be a completely uh, credible, even to the, you know, to fairly substantially pro-war people, as someone who thought telling truth to the U.S. government would help us win the war and then realizing the war was wrong and saying it, and then talking about GIs as equivalent to the same, to the, to the men who fought the, you know, the, uh, uh, what is it, the generation, the uh, World War II vets. Uh, so he's set up to be very sympathetic to those who don't share our point of view, and then making it clear that he thought the war was morally wrong, and that the only reason that people talked about me live was because it was being done with uh, M16s instead of bombs and artillery, which he said would, would mean no one would, think of, would talk about it, and they didn't. So I just think there are things in that film that if we overlook and don't emphasize and magnify ourselves, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so it's not enough to be critical of it in the ways we all know, but, uh, but there's so much in that film that opens a door for us and we should walk through it boldly. Uh, so I think the next thing that's happening is that we have, according to Terry, a two minute break. And then we are back here, we are back here because James Jefferson Jr. is gonna have some things to tell us before we walk to the wall. I'm gonna say just two final things and hopefully we'll see other, we'll see folks tomorrow to continue the conversation. But um, I said this morning that uh, our, I criticized two years ago for the fact that we tried to do in one day what should have been done in three days. Well, I'm afraid we have ourselves in the same situation. Obviously, there is a lot that needs to be said. There's a lot that needs to uh, be broken down into all kinds of different sectors. So we learn what was learned from draft resistance, from lobbying, from uh, direct action from the hundred different modes of anti-war activity. And we need to try to find a forum, whether it's this Kent State thing or something on the anniversary of, of the uh, moratorium, to get as wide a range of people together in a residential setting where they're gonna spend some time within each of those sectors and try and and bring together some learning from, from what was done, as well as overarching learning things and projecting out things. I think a lot of stuff got thrown up. We had to call, obviously shut down some things just because we were running out of time, but uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. And if we get to the point that we think there's some kind of uh, basis for moving ahead into another large scale 
conversation. We will be in touch with you and ask for your your response and hopefully your support or after we change it based on your response, your support. Um, the only, th only other thing I want to say in terms of the just concluded discussion is that because of the work I did that Susan alluded to in terms of the immediate post-war and the normalization struggle, I mean, I've known Tommy Valley for a long time and I respect what he's done, but the way it comes across is that that was the only thing that was being done. Um, the Burns and Novick people are very good at looking critically at everything that the Pentagon Papers exposed, but then they take whole hog, the sort of official spin about what happened in the last years of the war and the first years of peace. And uh, there are a lot of other people that it was not just the NGOs that Susan mentioned, but uh, the original Vietnam Veterans of America, Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, uh, Bobby Muller and other people that were, and, and veterans groups that you've never heard of, probably the Veterans Vietnam Restoration Project that was building clinics and schools. And there's, there's a lot of things that need to be filled in. Uh, the NGOs that worked in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during the war, um, they have a little bit about the IVS guy that was killed early on, but they never mention again International Voluntary Services and Don Luce and Sally Benson and all the people that quit IVS because of their protest of the war. So it's like that whole sector of who we were uh, simply doesn't appear at all in the series. And, so, and that sector, as it goes on, to, as Susan talked about it after the uh, end of the war, just very quickly, uh, that disappears. And Tommy says, acts as though he were the first veteran to go back. <laughs> um, and it's not to diminish the importance of what Tommy did, especially with John Kerry and John McCain, which were vitally important in getting us to the point of normalization. The only other thing I'd say, and this will be uh, a little bit promotional, that the we inevitably are focused backwards, uh, and legitimately so because the backwards is still having an effect today, both in public consciousness and in terms of the legacies of war, the landmines, UXO, Agent Orange. But that's not what Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia are today. That's a part of them, an important part of them. They're aware of them. Susan talked about how much money was raised in Vietnam for Agent Orange stuff. So they are very conscious of it, but they also are moving into a whole new world with dynamic economies, problems of various kinds, like other countries in Southeast Asia. But whether uh, you go with Vietnam, the Veterans for Peace is doing a trip, we're doing a trip both around My Lai, or just go on your own. Find a way to connect everything that is was important and still is important with coming to terms with where uh, the three countries are today. Um, it's proven tremendously important for veterans. I think it's equally important for veterans of the anti-war movement civilian veterans of the anti-war movement. So find a way to, to take yourself to the three countries uh, while you're still able to, to make it happen. So um, I, Jim Reston Jr., I happened to go, when I was here for a planning meeting for our program, for this program, um, there was a, a program at the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, in which he was talking about the wall and its history. And I was so impressed by it, especially when he said he wanted to speak at our conference. Um, that absolutely impressed me. Uh, and so I want, we wanted to give him a chance before we go to the wall, and Terry will talk to you about <coughs> that a bit, uh, to give him a chance to fill in what happened around the controversy. You've got some of that in, in Burns Novick, but not all of it by any means. Uh, and finally, finally, let, since I won't be speaking podium-wise again, is just to thank Terry uh, uh, for all he's done in terms of the creation of, of today and Ann Gallivan and 
a whole bunch of other people who volunteers. But thank you, Terry, and thank you, Hannah. So, Jim, do you want to? So I have always wanted to see a crowd like yours at the Vietnam Wall. Um, just as a matter of bona fides, um, I found my wife in the tear gas in front of the Vietnam Embassy in 1970, so that's why I come to you. I've heard some talk uh, in this group about how there should really be a memorial for the resistance to Vietnam, somewhere on the mall, somewhere in the relationship to, uh, to the Vietnam Wall. I think that's absolutely wrong. Um, to begin with, um, in writing this book about uh, the five-year art war over the building of the Mylan Wall, it was so clear how many millions of dollars are involved that you need the uh, authorization of various um, you know, entities in Washington. For a memorial about the resistance, you would come upon the political atmosphere of today, plus the indifference generally, collectively, um, towards the Vietnam that one finds uh, outside. As you know, I'm sure there was an effort to get a museum uh, built contiguous to the Vietnam Wall. The funding for that is faltering, and I would venture to say it will never be built. But much more profoundly than that, you already have a memorial on the wall. Uh, it's true that it began as a Vietnam veterans, military veterans uh, memorial, uh, and they raised the funds for it. They went through the very difficult political um, navigation to, um, to get the thing authorized at congressional and White House levels and so forth. They fought the political battles and they got the political support. So indeed, initially, it was a Vietnam veterans memorial. But remember the rule that was put down for uh, all the entrance, all 1,421 entrance to, for the commission for a Vietnam wall. It was to be apolitical. There was to be no opinion expressed in the artistic uh, entry of that to, for it to be considered. And what a triumph has emerged from that single rule. But the true magic of the Vietnam Wall now is not only the four or five million that go to see it every year, but the true magic decades later is that it's been universalized. It has transcended veterans, military veterans. It's transcended even the Vietnam War. Uh, and it has become something for the entire Vietnam generation. That generation faced terrible choices to serve in an undeclared and immoral war or not, to, uh, to avoid it however one could, either legally or uh, illegally. It's personal for everyone who was of uh, age from 19, whatever it was, uh, 65 to, um, to 1974. Um, so the wall has come to embrace the experience of that entire uh, generation. And it has come, in my, my view, to be a welcoming place for pacifists as much as for warriors, for exiles as much as those who have families that lost uh, their family members in Vietnam. So I'm totally thrilled that you're going to be there. This wall is uh, for you as well. You really are Vietnam veterans also. And it is really when you go there today, I would have you um, 
have you think of this as a unique place in America of contemplation, not simply for uh, Vietnam, but for all wars. And the central experience that I hope that you will have as you view that astonishing um, catalog of 58,000 names is that what you're viewing there is the cost of war. So it's transcendent, it's the cost of that war, but it's the cost of all wars. It is a trap, I think, to get into this thing of uh, being a resistor or being a soldier. Um, the soldiers who initially came there and who continue to come today are not your adversaries, they really are your brothers. And what people, what politicians really wanted in 1967 was to set one segment of the Vietnam generation against another. It was the resistors against the warriors. Um, and uh, I think we now, four decades later, um, need to get away from that. Those people you may see grieving today are not your adversaries, but your brothers in this entire generational experience. Even the three soldiers, bear in mind that the sculptor of the three soldiers was himself a Vietnam resistor. Frederick Hart was with you on the mall in the, in the mid-1960s. Uh, and you can ignore the military garb as artistically perfect as it is and look at the faces. It's not the faces of Rambos or rah-rah gung-ho warriors at all. And this is, is, is the, the, uh, the, the achievement of that artist to focus not on glory and valor, but on youth and on confusion and awe and camaraderie and exhaustion. All of those emotions you felt, I felt, when uh, I was involved after my military service in uh, the anti-war movement. So look for, for that expression in relation to the ocean of the dead for the awe, the confusion, the youth, the camaraderie, and the exhaustion. You as resi resistors can relate to those emotions. This, the cost of war, was what you tried to stop. And you deserve the lion's share of stopping it. So this is a place for you about the stopping of that carnage. So focus upon the cost of war. Think broadly beyond Vietnam, beyond the warriors and the lost ones. Think about what you can't see. Uh, your resistance is there and should be palpable. But we also need to think about the cost of, of America losing its honor in that war.